it'll be fun. Good. All right. I'm going to change my. Here we go. All right. Happy noon hour, everyone. It is right at noon. I'm hearing the bells outside. So I assume that people are still going to be taking some time to trickle in. Um, but we'll get started uh, with today's teaching chat. So you have made it to the uh, Teaching and Learning Center professional development series that we have every Wednesday at noon. I am not Don Saucier, uh, nor am I Noah Rankin, nor Ashley Schiffer, who are our normal hosts for uh, the TLC professional development series. I'm stepping in today um, as another member of the Teaching and Learning Center team. I am the director of the new Faculty Institute. Yay! <laughs> um, so for better or worse, you get me today. <laughs> Um, today we're going to be talking about mentoring junior colleagues. This is a teaching chat, so it's much more informal, uh, where we just bounce ideas off each other, share a little bit about our experiences, things that we can do, learn from each other. Um, so I always find these teaching chats very valuable. Um, I'm going to start by playing our land acknowledgement, if I can get it right. So bear with me one moment as I share my sound and get this up. Okay, has everyone seen my screen? Excellent. All right, let's I'm gonna play our land acknowledgement. Oops. Here we go. As the first land grant institution established under the 1862 Morrill Act, we acknowledge that the state of Kansas is historically home to many native nations, including the Kaw, Osage, and Pawnee, among others. Furthermore, Kansas is the current home to four federally recognized Native nations, the Prairie Band Potawatomi, the Kickapoo Tribe of Kansas, the Iowa Tribe of Kansas and Nebraska, and the Sac and Fox Nation of Missouri in Kansas and Nebraska. Many Native nations utilized the Western Plains of Kansas as their hunting grounds, and others, such as the Delaware, were moved through this region during Indian removal efforts to make way for white settlers. It's important to acknowledge this, since the land that serves as the foundation of this institution was, and still is, stolen land. We remember these truths because K-State's status as a land-grant institution is a story that exists within ongoing settler colonialism and rests on the dispossession of indigenous peoples and nations from their lands. These truths are often invisible to many. The recognition that K-State's history begins and continues through indigenous contexts is essential. Please remember these truths because we still remember okay um so as i mentioned previously our uh, topic for today is mentoring junior colleagues before we dive into that conversation i want to take a moment to plug next week's event next week uh wednesday is valentine's day february 14th so if you have someone that you need to do something special for that day you have a week uh so just a, a reminder there um but in honor of love and in all of its forms uh we're going to have a talk on community engagement and service learning which is a way to show love to our communities and our students that's going to be presented by Tamara Bauer, Trish Gott, and Tim Steffensmeyer. Uh, so look forward to that next week. Today, as I said, we're going to be talking about mentoring junior colleagues. And you can think like maybe you are a junior colleague um, and you think like, how can I do mentoring uh, for junior colleagues when that's what I am? Um, mentoring, I think, is such an important part of what we do as faculty because mentoring really extends to our students, our, if we're teaching graduate students, um, undergraduates, and also our colleagues. And just because they're, uh, you know, we might have junior colleagues, but also just our peers. We learn a lot from each other. Um, and while I might be uh, more junior in one area, I might have some expertise or knowledge in another area that could help someone um, with whom I'm more of a peer or even someone who's more uh, senior than I am in the academic hierarchy. Um, ooh, Habitat for Humanities Gala. So uh, Brandon has just dropped in the chat. Uh, if you haven't made plans for Valentine's Day evening, consider joining Habitat for Humanities Gala and enjoy dinner, dancing, and live music. 
for uh, from the Thundering Cats Big Band at the Hilton Garden Inn. Okay, 30 tickets left and there's a link in the chat. So check that out. Uh, thanks for plugging that. It's a great space to plug different events. Um, so to get started, I would like to invite us all to think about effective mentors that you have had in your life. And this can be like a formal mentor, maybe a, a PhD a thesis advisor or um, an official mentor in your department, or it could be informal mentors that you've had along the way who kind of guided you and, and helped you in forming who you are personally and professionally. And then I invite you to take a minute to think, put this person in your mind, think about the ways that they were effective, what they did that you found really helpful, um, and just we'll marinate on this for a minute, right? What who, what, what is this person like? What was their relationship with you? So an important mentor in your life. this is one of the things that I am working on in my teaching is to really make sure that when I'm asking people to think and give them time, that I actually am quiet for a moment <laughs> and give them time. Um, we'll start now. I want to invite you to either um, drop in the chat or unmute yourself. Um, and I want us to start brainstorming what are characteristics of an effective mentor. In your experience, excellent. So good listener and supportive. So uh, listening is an excellent characteristic. What other? What are other characteristics of um, an effective mentor in your experience or what would you like to see? Sorry, I'm late, so I just jumped in. But welcome. We're happy to have to unmute or chat. Yes, unmute or chat. We're talking about uh, mentors, mentors, mentors that we have had in our lives, and so we started thinking about kind of effective mentors that we've had, either formal mentors or informal mentors. And now I'm inviting everyone to kind of come up with characteristics of a, an effective mentor, a good mentor. So being resourceful and have a good network of people to connect with me, that's a really great one is being able to, I, I find that when you're a, a more junior colleague and kind of starting out in your field, it feels, it can feel very isolating um, that you just don't know anyone. You don't know how to interact. I know that when I first started going to conferences, I was just like, felt very alone amongst a sea of people. Um, and since then, I've gotten to know a lot of people in my field. Now I go to conferences and I love them because I get to see all of my friends and colleagues. Um, but that wasn't always the case. And so remembering our junior colleagues, grad students, and inviting them to come along on more of those social encounters and allowing them to meet people in the profession can be excellent. Let's see, what else do we have? Empathetic, but able, not afraid to point out areas of improvement with the desire to help you improve. That's fantastic, Brandon. Um, that idea that being kind doesn't mean not being truthful. Um, and you can be truthful and still point out that like this is to help you improve, um, always with that constructive piece of it, right? Like this is what you're doing well. We do that with our students in, in feedback, hopefully, right? This is something that I see that you're really strong in, you're doing well. Here's an area of growth for you. Um, allowed me space to work without oversight, but was always available for questions and support as I needed it. Ooh, this is a really fine line to walk, right? Like this, 
you want to, as a mentor, you want to provide support, but you don't want to provide too much support. And I always find that um, in my grad program, on the teaching side, I maybe had a little less support than what was um, ideal. Um, but in a lot of ways, having to do things on my own allowed me to figure out like, oh, okay, this is what I have to do. I had to be resourceful. And so that helped me grow into who I am and helped me a lot in, in developing my own teaching. But it would have been nice to have a little bit more guidance on certain things. Um, I felt like I it took me a while to learn some things that I could have learned earlier with a little bit more guidance. Um, additional things in the chat, provide encouragement when things are difficult. Yes, this can be, especially in academia, there's times where we're just like, why am I here? Um, providing that support to be like, yeah, this is a hard moment, but it's not going to last. Um, provide that encouragement. Good listener, good guidance, positive attitude. One that I could go with, uh, that I could go to with anything, willing to answer questions no matter what the questions, and didn't make me feel like I was stupid for not knowing. Did a great job of walking me around the campus, walking around the building, helping me orient myself and introducing me to people along the way, supportive with the protocols within the department. Yeah, I think that um, that's something I've worked at uh, five different institutions now. Every institution has its own culture. And so kind of providing that guidance of what is the culture here? What are the expectations? Um, this can be something that's really challenging. You kind of get to the point, um, you know, there's that saying where uh, someone looks at a fish and says, how's the water? And the fish says, what's water? I feel like that happens to us when we're in our department for a while. It's like, what's the department culture? We're like, what are you talking about? Like, it just is. You have to remind yourself that like, oh, for someone who's coming in, who's new, they don't have any clue what the expectations are, the way that we interact with each other. And so providing some explicit guidance on kind of what the norms are of the department can be a really positive thing. Who to talk to when you're, you know, when you have different issues, like where are the people on campus to connect to um, is really positive. Um, trust, oh, that's a great one. Um, yeah, you want someone who you can trust and that you feel like if you go to them with a question, which is similar to what Beth had said, right, that you can go to them with anything and, and they're not going to make you feel stupid. Um, I still, my PhD advisor, I'll still reach out to him every so often and say, you know, I got this email from someone, like, is this normal? Is And he's really great about responding to me and being like, this is normal, this isn't normal. If you're going to get, like, He's uh, very open with compensation as well. Um, so he said, oh, I've been asked to do things like this before and this is what I was compensated. You should be compensated something similar. I think that that is like, I am so appreciative of him being open and willing to have those kinds of conversations, those taboo conversations about money um, that so often we don't wanna talk about. It feels like uncomfortable to talk about money. Um, but it's important to make sure that our junior colleagues aren't getting taken advantage of in areas where if compensation, monetary compensation is expected, they should know exactly what, what to expect. Is it expected that, you know, if they're traveling somewhere, should their travel be uh, covered? How does that usually happen in your field? What kind of uh, honorarium might be common in a certain situation? These kinds of things can be really, really helpful. Um, does not make me feel dumb on things that are new to me. Absolutely treats you with respect that just because we haven't encountered a situation and we're naive on a certain thing does not mean that we're unintelligent beings um, and that we don't bring value to what we do um, in other contexts. Um, yeah, so what are, are there specific pieces of advice that you have found really helpful or unhelpful in your professional development that you've received from mentors? Respects your position and doesn't make you feel less than. Oh, yes, absolutely. I have very little patience for social hierarchical thinking, um, right? You know, I 
greatly respect and value uh, my peers' experience and having a lot of experience is wonderful, but that doesn't automatically mean that then just because you have years more experience that you deserve more, better, um, that everyone else must bow to your whims. <laughs> Maybe I say that because I'm still junior faculty. <laughs> what is the official de definition of junior faculty? Oh, that's a really good question. So I would say I've always understood junior faculty to mean uh, not tenured or in the, um, the lower rung of the promotion scale. And so um, for tenure, tenure track, that would be an untenured faculty member, assistant professor. For something like the, the teaching assistant professor track, then you'd have teaching assistant once you get to teaching associate professor. Um, I wouldn't consider that junior faculty. But I think that this is also a good question because um, I feel like m there are more and more options of what you can be as faculty. And so some people uh, like are solely research, some people are solely instructional. Um, what are the promotions? Ah, yes. So with uh, the tenure, tenure track, you have assistant professor, associate professor, and then full professor. Um, and then I believe that the teaching assistant track uh, goes teaching assistant professor, teaching associate professor, full teaching professor. Um, so the difference being that the tenure track position typically has a research component to it and the teaching, uh, track typically does not, or has a significantly less, uh, smaller research component to it. Instructors, that depends a lot, I think, on the department. I don't know how instructional promotions go. Uh, uh, just, uh, I think it varies by college. Each college kind of has their own policy. So for instance, in the College of Business, we have three different instructor titles. There's no pay associated with, with any of them. It's just a matter of time. You turn in the application and then you might get promoted, but it's it's really just in title only. And so I, I think it just matters by college, but for the most, yeah. for, for all intents and purposes, like there's, there's no promotion, promotion track for non-tenure track instructors in our college. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that that's the, the title of instructor tends to be much more nebulous as to what it is, what the expectations are and like promotion kind of tracks. Um, the teaching assistant track, I believe like that's, that track is coming up to kind of try to put some more, um, what's the word, like structure into like what it is to be a, a teaching faculty member. Why is it that each college has different standards and expectations for promotion? Oof. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I mean, I think that a lot of it has to do with what the expectations are in terms of like your own disciplines, like production and what is expected for you to accomplish. Um, but if anyone else has uh, insight as to why colleges have different standards and expectations for promotion. I'd love to hear it. I don't have all the answers. <laughs> I'm just here to facilitate conversation. So let's pivot and <laughs> tradition. <laughs> Yes, that's typically the answer for most things in academia, um, for better or worse. Um, let's pivot a little bit. I'd like to think about um, what is something that you wish you knew early on in your career? Something that you wish that people had told you or that you wish you had more support on? Something that you wish you knew about earlier in your career? Um, I can give an example for me. Uh, I wish that I had known early on in job searching about how to write a teaching statement. Um, I had been told you have to write a teaching statement. I did not get a whole lot of guidance as to what that was. And it wasn't until 
I had already done a round or two on the job market that I found actual research articles that's like, here's what a teaching statement is. Here is what it sh how you should write it. Here are some suggestions of what you can do. Talk to a trusted mentor about the norms in your field. Um, and that totally changed. It's like, oh. Um, and then I was able to develop a pretty convincing teaching statement. And uh, well, I mean, I got a, a number of job interviews after rewriting my teaching statement. So I, I think it was effective. But what are things that you all wish that you had known early on in your career? So I'll just jump in here. Um, so I came from the teaching field, right? So in the field of education. So um, and my soul, like the purpose of my job as a teaching assistant professor is to do that. Right. Um, but, um, I had never had to craft a syllabus for a course before. And so to be thrown in and just say, okay, you got to have a syllabus and blow. Like I had no idea, like, what does a syllabus include? Right. What's expected to be in a syllabus? Um, you know, like some people, you know, have a description of every single assignment that's going to happen. Some people just have a description of some, some people don't, you know, like, are there, you know, typical things you would see in a syllabus, right? And of course I know then there's those expected statements that we're all supposed to have right from the college. And so just like being able to understand that, like I, I didn't know that and understand that. And so somebody was just like, here, here's mine. Right. And so when I started, I basically just took somebody's right. And like interchanged, you know, my content basically. And it, as I was going through that first semester, like one of the things I realized is some of the things that this person put in their syllabus, I can't follow. Like that's not in my, that doesn't hold true to my philosophy of teaching. And so I'd said all of these things in the syllabus, right? And, but now like, as I'm going back and looking at it, it wasn't me. And so I actually did a lot of research um, and study on syllabi and like what makes an effective syllabus um, I and, always love book recommendations. There are great books out there yeah, about how I, to write a syllabus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it was those like, but I had to go out and like, you know, do that. And I like the only example I had seen was the one that was given to me, you know, like I didn't, ha I hadn't seen multiple, right. I hadn't talked to somebody about how do you sit down and think about your syllabus. Right. And mm -hmm. so that was a big, that was a big deal for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I have to echo you my first, uh, well, I got a job as a, an adjunct faculty member as I was completing my PhD at an institution that was nearby my, my grad institution. And I had the same kind of thing. Like I just took a syllabus that I got from someone else who had a very different teaching style from me. Um, and, and I swapped out, like, these are the assignments that we're gonna have, but the rest of the syllabus was pretty much the same. Um, and looking back, I thought, oh my gosh, this is just, it's so cold compared to what I would want my syllabus, what I want to present as my teaching persona. Um, and it was very like policies forward. So it was like, you will do this. You won't do this. You must do this. You shan't do this. Um, <laughs> I was just like, wow, like this isn't what I want my students to see. Like this isn't like, I think now about my syllabus as the first uh, introduction to the course, right? That, what's the, what, what's the word? The, the first, first impression. That's the word, thank you. <laughs> the first impression of the course. And so I want my students to, when they read the syllabus, to have an understanding of what this course is gonna be, who I am as a, as a teacher right. um, and see that. And so I think that that's a, that's a big one is kind of like, what are yeah. these, and not just the syllabus, but like calendars, like what, what are these documents that we're expected yeah. to prepare? That was um, another what are the thing. Norms? What do we have to have? What mm -hmm. is good practice to have? And what's like your own personal taste? Right. Um, I always go back and forth because I want to include a lot of information, but I also really don't want my document to be 15 pages. And mm -hmm. so like, Right now it's like 10. So I'm mm -hmm. not doing great in terms of the length, but um, but yeah, like I have this like, oh, I want to be concise, but I also mm -hmm. want to get the information across. Right. So like for me, <clears throat> coming from the education world, right? Like it was 
um, a complete kind of shift for me to have to think about having my entire semester like laid out and given like, here's what we're going to be doing every single week. And here are the assignments that we're going to be doing every week because I, you know, like I'm used to being responsive, right? So we may have to, I may have to take this, this plan that I had for today and move it over to tomorrow. Right. Or I had, and so I struggled like with that idea that, oh my gosh, I have this now in stone and I have to know exactly what like assignment I'm going to do every week and how that's all going to pan out. Right. And so, um, that's been, that's been something I have grappled with and it's kind of evolved for me, um, over the years as I've been like trying to work with it. And, um, but that, I don't know, I'd love yeah. to hear what other people do. I struggle a little bit with that as well, just because uh, like with teaching objectives, for instance, I'm like, I want to have teaching objectives, but I also am getting to a point where I want to invite my students to participate in creating those objectives. And yeah. so if I have them already laid out in my syllabus and like, these are the objectives, mm -hmm. um, it feels like we can't have a good conversation on the first day of the class as to like, what do you want to get out of this class? Right. Right. So, and I'm not, I'm not saying that I don't like plan. Like I have a course oh. map <laughs> right, that I keep and it has every little thing. Right. And I'm constantly in it every week, moving things around and looking at it. It has my essential questions, you know, for each week and things like that. But, you know, I really struggled with saying, so on week four, you're going to do this assignment. And, you know, like, because what if we're not there yet? Like what, how, you know, and so I learned, right. You the disclaimers go in there and you talk about those things, but it was just, um, it was, it was just something I had to, I had to figure out how I was going to represent like from my style of teaching in my syllabus and yet still give the students enough information that they can plan ahead and think about things. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. How about others? What are other things that uh, either like build, building more off of this conversation documents and things that you didn't know how to create or wish, or maybe that you got great advice on um, or other things that you wish you had known? Sarah put a comment in the chat. I was just responding to that. So yeah, the fact that despite how tenure track faculty position looks from outside, it has actually a very do it yourself and alone career. I think that this is something that is, and it, academia is a weird, weird space, right? We give a lot of lip service to interdisciplinarity. Um, and, and that is really positive, um, but it varies widely as to how much that interdisciplinarity is actually valued among your uh, peers in your department and the way that like we actually uh, acknowledge that that work and so a lot of times it can feel like especially when you're the only one in your department who has your kind of profile which I think for a lot of us is kind of the case that you end up like okay like I have a lot of colleagues who work at other institutions that I collaborate with read their work you know consult with at conferences um, but when I'm here in the day-to-day, -day, like there's not a lot of people with my research profile who quite understand what I'm doing. And that can feel very isolating. Are there other things that you all wish you had known before starting your professional career, or maybe even as far back as graduate school. I know that when I started grad school, I had 
no clue what I was doing. I just was like, I think that this is an interesting topic and I would like to learn more. And I remember at orientation, having my professors talk to me about, you know, uh, going to conferences and publishing in journals and just being absolutely terrified going, I think I made a huge mistake. This doesn't sound like something that I can do. Like, I don't even know what a conference is or what I would do there. Um, and so, you know, it took a while for me to uh, warm up to even the idea of going to a conference. Um, and fortunately, I had uh, a wonderful professor who helped me write my first conference abstract and prepare a presentation. Um, I did not go to any conferences before I went to present at a conference. And that is something that I really wish that somebody had encouraged me to do. Um, because I had no, I, I just was, it was all, all the information I had about conferences was what other people had told me about them, not my own experience of seeing kind of what the possibilities were. So Sarah responds, you have a lot of responsibilities for tenure track that you can never ask others to help you with. For example, if you're overwhelmed with the amount of work, you can never ask for assistance in grading, reviewing your papers, writing your P&T documents, meeting with students. Yeah, there's so much that like we are not interchangeable pieces in our department. Again, going back to that, like you may be the only person who kind of does your research. Um, and when you have grading, for instance, uh, that's something that is like, you, unless you have a TA. Um, <laughs> but if you don't have a TA for your course, then all that grading is on you. Um, and even if you do have a GTA for your course that can help you with grading, then you're overseeing the grad student and you have to provide guidance there. And so I always find that, um, you know, having uh, student workers to help out can be really helpful. Um, sometimes it ends up being about as much work as it would be to just do it yourself. <laughs> Um, you know, and I'm happy to have student workers for the mentorship part of it. It's like, ah, this would, I could do this in about the same amount of time, but it's good experience for my students. And so I'm happy to like have that as part of my mentorship role for them. But, uh, it's a lot of work overseeing students and grad students. Did you want to speak more to that, Sarah? Or have you said all you said your piece? So Andy, I'll, this is Tim Bolton from physics. I'm actually a department head. So let me throw some things in. Oh, please uh, do. Yes. So, so one, you know, one of the great challenges is we're all super highly achieving people. We're all super competent and we believe we, know, we need no help. And so <laughs> one of the great challenges is talking people into asking for help. And so the issues that you just brought up I would take all of these issues to your department head. <laughs> if you need help grading, go to your department head. You should more generally ask for help. Uh, it, it is totally in the department head's interest, even if you just think this is all a zero sum game and driven by self-interest. It is totally in the department head's interest to tenure assistant professors. There is no upside to junior faculty failing, no upside at all. There's no upside to people blowing it in their courses. And a, a major problem is people just don't ask for help. And I, I can't swear for every department head across campus, but the ones I know would jump on the opportunity to offer help. That's, that's my spiel. <laughs> that is wonderful. Thank you for jumping in and providing your expert advice on that, because that is true. Um, and just, you know, I can say that not as a department head, but as a, a member of my department, we want everyone in our department to be successful. It's not, um, there's not this competition between us. Like we're all on the same team. We all want to do well. And so um, asking for help and support when you need it, there are certain things that are hard to pass off to other people. But there's always the possibility of finding ways to adjust schedules or um, find ways to, to offer support when you're feeling overwhelmed. 
I'll also plug, uh, I mean, the new Faculty Institute and other, uh, there are other events on campus. There are a lot of events that have uh, like training on how to use different um, system platforms or how to you you know how to more effectively create a syllabus or these kinds of things um it can feel a little overwhelming to like go to another one of these things like this right now you're taking time out of your day to sit and listen to this talk and have a conversation but i think ultimately taking those bits of time to invest in learning more and professional development ultimately saves you time in the end um, or at least helps you to, because then you go like, oh, somebody mentioned this at that teaching chat, or somebody mentioned this in this talk that I went to about how to use Canvas, or then you're, you're getting the support that you need. Um, likewise, there are instructional designers on campus all over the place uh, who can help you if you're like, I'm just not sure how to get this set up on Canvas, or I'm not sure how to like set up my course. Um, that's not something that you have to do alone. That's something that you can get support on. Yay, we have <laughs> a, an additional comment from one of our instructional uh, developers. Uh, Trina says, I will also throw out there that on the teaching side, instructional designers are available for support and guidance in some of the topics covered today, developing a syllabus, designing a quality course, possibly more efficient grading strategies, uh, library staff are another great and sometimes underutilized resource. That's one that I will say I most semesters, I will schedule in a day where uh, I bring my students to the library and I have our librarian in modern languages is Sarah Kearns um, and she's fantastic. Yay, librarians. <laughs> um, I often have schedule one day in the semester where my students go over there and they learn something about how to use library databases or how to use Zotero or like things that will make my students' lives easier. The plus side is, is that that's also a day that I don't have to lesson plan for. <laughs> so um, sometimes I strategically figure out how to put those in my schedule. If I have a week where I'm like, oh boy, I have a lot of things going on that week. Like, how am I gonna make this work? if the librarians are available that week to uh, do a class for me and teach my students something about resources in the library, that's a great way for me to get a little bit of relief on my teaching. And then also uh, the students, I've heard, I, one time I took my students over to the library, we did a little library tour of the innovation lab and, and got some information there. And uh, we walked out and one of my students was like, I love when our class goes to the library. And I was like, <laughs> it's a win for everyone. Um, yes, the, the Innovation Center is also a great tool. Um, I've also found like to, to go off of this like workload, um, I've realized more and more that I have a tendency to try to do more in a semester than is reasonable. And it ends up with stressed students and a stressed me because I'm like, oh, I wanna teach them all the things. Um, and I can't teach them all the things that I know. I have been doing what I do for years. Um, and so there's no way in one semester I'm gonna be able to tr transmit all my knowledge to my students. So picking and choosing like very strategically, um, this semester I've added in a number of in-class work days um, that allows like as, Beth was kind of alluding to like, you're not quite sure what's gonna happen a couple weeks down the line. That allows for some flexibility. If I see that, hey, there's this concept that my students are still really struggling with, let's use that in-class work day to really work through this a little bit more, or maybe they have a project coming up and we're feeling really good about the material we've done. It's like, okay, in, in class, we're gonna take some time to work on that project that you have coming up. But having some flex space in your, in your schedule um, each semester can be really helpful. <laughs> uh, yes, Trina and I, we're like simpatico here. Uh, <laughs> talking about the libraries, talking about things you can do, but that's something too, yes, that I feel like, um, being aware of kind of ways that you can strategically put in breaks in your teaching can be really helpful. 
How about other great mentors that you've had in your lives? What are things that they have done for you? Um, specific pieces of advice that have been wonderful for you? We can think, we've talked a lot about the teaching side of things, which makes sense because this is a teaching chat and we talk a lot about teaching here, but we can think also in terms of research and service, um, that nebulous category of service that is just forever. Um, ooh, writing great letters of support. That can be a great one. And also I would add to that, teaching you how to write great letters of support. Uh, <laughs> that was something that took me a while to to learn um like how do i write you know if i'm asked to write a letter of recommendation or a letter of support like what does that look like what's going to be convincing um you know i want if i'm going to take the time to write something i want it to be impactful Uh, this is something that I've learned uh, recently, and uh, this is not exactly from a mentor or anything. Uh, yeah. so, well, a lot of uh, um, uh, faculty members may use uh, well uh, AI uh, to generate uh, well uh, letters of recommendations. Uh, but well, uh, uh, from uh, uh, I think I don't know exactly it was from Kansas Board of uh, Regent or. Uh, somebody will uh, uh, will basically uh, say that well uh, it, it's kind of a policy that well we should not be including uh, student related information or any kind of confidential information in uh, chat GPT or any kind of generative AI uh, will uh, platform because well uh, that would not be appropriate but of course well uh, generative AI can help you to come up with a generic letter and then, well, you can edit those. Well, so that's, that might help uh, be helpful. Uh, so I don't know whether any one of you have ever uh, done that. Maybe Brandon would have a better idea. <laughs> yeah, Our Brandon. resident AI whiz. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 sorry, I can't say I'm super familiar with that policy. I'd be interested to kind of see exactly what they consider. Is, Personally identifiable information could totally understand. Um, I, I would think without looking at the policy that a lot of the things I'm going to talk about a student and a recommendation letter would not fall under that, but I could be very wrong. I'm often am. I was going to say, I think that if, you know, obviously I wouldn't put the student's name into <laughs> the AI generator, um, but but yeah, I think that having like a generic template, which is something that I have had for a long time is I have my own generic template of like letter of recommendation. And then I just put in specifics. Um, I find that a positive letter of recommendation or support, uh, like it has to have specifics to be uh, impactful about what the person has done. And so then I'm having to come up with that to put it in AI to put in the letter. And at that point, I think like, why don't I just write my own letter? But but um, I'm also not an AI whiz. And so maybe there are tips and tricks to do it faster. Ooh, thanks, Livia, for including uh, the policy in the chat. Um, well, I'll give an answer before I read the policy. So I'm- Excellent. I'm still, I love uninformed ignorant. opinions. Still, still ignorant <laughs> of the policy and complete. Um, plausible deniability. Um, the way that I do it, uh, I'll, I'll admit this is how I've used ChatGPT for what is recommendations. I'll usually ask the student, you know, when I agree to do it, and say, "Hey, can you send me a bullet list of things that you think I ought to consider that that I should know about you, or you think I know about you that should be included in this letter, so I at least get some of the key points? You know, yeah, I would, did well in this class. I was on this project. I part of these clubs, and then um, I basically." copy those bullet points, go into chat GPT and say, I'm writing a student, uh, writing a letter of recommendation for a student to go to this particular program, this particular school. Here are some things that I'd like to weave into this letter, and then I'll add a few more. Here are some things that, that I, I specifically remember or that I want to make emphasis. 
you know, hit enter. Usually gives me a pretty good draft that I can copy and paste and then, you know, make sure it sounds like it's coming to my voice. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that's not, does not run too foul from what I'm about to read and what <laughs> Livia said. I was, Livia I was just going to add on. It's a little bit vague. Yeah. Go ahead, Beth. Yeah. I was just going to add on that, like, when I have students that ask for letters of reference or recommendation, right, whether they're looking for a teaching job, whether they're looking to get into another program, you know, a higher, um, higher level program or whatever it is, I always ask them if it's a program or if it's some kind of special scholarship or something like that, can you please send me some information about the scholarship, the program, et cetera, right, so that I know what I'm writing towards and then i i ask them to also attach their most up uh, most recent resume and so that helps to support me as well because then i can include things like oh wow like they volunteer in the community right so i can also include other aspects that maybe i didn't know about them and write a little bit more well-rounded kind of um piece about them yeah I'll add to that as well. When I have students approach me for letters of recommendation, I ask for those things as well. I also ask that they write me a short paragraph explaining why they're going for this program grant, whatever whatever the thing is, like why and why do they think that they're a good candidate, um, and then to include anything that I that they want would like me to highlight, specifically thinking about things that they've done in my class. Um, as I, I tell them, I have a terrible memory. Um, like, and so if you jog my memory and say, oh, I did this project in your class on X, then I can go, oh, that's right. They did that project that was really great and I can talk all about it. Um, but asking specifically when students ask you or when peers ask you for letters of recommendation or support, um, having that like specific information from them that you would like them to provide you um, is wonderful. I have actually had on my to-do list for quite some time now. Um, I maintain a, a professional website of, you know, things that I do in my teaching and, and research. And I've been wanting to include a, a page on there of like, if you're asking me for a letter of recommendation, here is what, here is how you should do that. Um, so that I can just send that on to my students and have it available for them on my course canvas page. Um, because I find that a lot of times I'm getting, like a lot of back and forth that could be done a lot quicker if I just say like, here's what I want. If you're going to ask me for a letter of recommendation, this is what I'm going to ask for you. It should be at least X amount of time in advance. This, this is the information that I'm going to want from you, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that it's something that I haven't done yet, but I like having kind of standardized things so that we can work more um, efficiently and effectively, right? Work smarter, not harder. But those are things that are are great to do. I'll have to check out the AI stuff. I did read, I read two different articles recently on AI that I think are informative for this. One being that AI uh, apparently writes better, stronger letters of recommendation than individuals. Um, in a study that was conducted. And so they were like, the AI letters were, were more convincing. Um, on the other hand, I read that uh, ChatGPT is getting dumber uh, because of all the human regular folk input. Um, and so that's also something to kind of consider. Um, I know that at the AI symposium last fall, um, there were talks um, regarding language acquisition and language teaching. And they said, like, you can have use chat GPT, your students can, as like a way to interact in the language. So they can like write to chat GPT and be like, hola, como estas? And then chat GPT will respond. The problem is, is that when students use chat GPT that way, all of their input, whether it's right or wrong, goes into chat GPT. And so... Uh, ChatGPT starts learning incorrect forms as well. And so it can be challenging. Um, while, while we're still on kind of the, just the technology um, topic, I'll paste this in the chat. So this is a tool that I use that I would want to share with anyone. It, it is just kind of a macro tool. So things that I have to type over and over and over and over and over and over again, um, I load into this software so that I can respond to email. So like 
student emails me to say they're not they're sick they're not going to be in class tomorrow i can type about five letters it basically pre-fills my email with a bunch of text and then i can it allows me to kind of have their name um, a date or other things that i just have to fill in those things and and press send so it just allows me to automate some of the more tedious you know text fields that you're doing over and over and over and over again as an instructor or teacher that's great i have like word docs that have common email templates for students but that's a that's a great resource um sarah asks if it's free i don't believe so i think i maybe pay 20 dollars a year or something like that but the amount of time it saves me it, it's a no-brainer that i pay it. do you get to use department maybe. funds to pay that or do you just i've never them? asked but i probably would i know there's some other tools i use that they do pay for so i would imagine they they probably would. So like, here's, I'll just put into the chat my auto response for a student who's sick. Um, mm -hmm. So, I think there is a way um, in Apple at least, and I don't know if it's on like the Mac too, but in the iPhone, there is somewhere where you can go in and type some of those most commonly used like phrases and things that you're typing all the time to do that. Like, so you put, press in a couple of, letters and then it'll bring it up kind of like that predictive text. Um, I can't put my hand on it right now, um, but I am I know that I have seen some trainings on using that um, on your phone. Great. Yes, I will paste a, an article on those. Th those ones are just like a, a batch of text, text replacement, I think is what it's called, um, which is a, a free solution as well. So that's Excellent. why, uh, Brandon, when I, I email you, I get a response in seconds with, uh, well, uh, two, three paragraphs, right? <laughs> a lot of those things are automated, yes. <laughs> Spill in your secrets. It's great. I love any suggestions to work smarter, not harder. Um, and this is one thing with mentoring, um, just finding a... a a community that you can share with and talk about these things. Again, they don't have you don't have to have necessarily senior colleagues with working with junior colleagues. Just chatting with other people in the profession can give you great ideas as to like how you can work smarter, not harder. Um, I'd like to recap the library not only for their teaching resources, but also um, if you're working on uh, doing research and, and interested in publishing your research, the library is a great resource to go and talk to about like where you can publish, how you can publish copyright issues, um, all of that kind of stuff the library has resources for. Um, we are getting to the end of our time. Are there any last minute like things that you still feel like you don't know about that you would like to know about, things that you wish that you had uh, mentorship for? where you are now, you can put them in the chat. You can privately chat them just to me if you don't want to share your own stuff with the wider group, but you want me to read them out. I won't read your name if you send them to me privately. Um, are there any things that you are still like, hmm, this would be a really good resource or I wish I knew more about X? Ooh, so I have a message about someone who's an assigned mentor to someone who doesn't want to be mentored. That is an interesting one. I think that this is something, and I would like to hear from others as well. Um, I think you can't force anyone to accept help if they're not interested, but I think uh, I would try to keep it as informal as possible. Thanks for joining us, Beth. Um, I would keep it as informal as possible and just say like, hey, why don't we go out for, you know, a coffee, tea or hot chocolate and uh, just chat a little bit about how things are going. Um, and then, you know, try to keep it, try to keep it informal 
and uh, and light rather than having like some kind of formal agenda um, and trying to let the the mentee kind of provide guidance as to what things they want to do, what things they're interested in um, that could allow you to just like send a link like, oh, I know that you mentioned that you were interested in X. Like I found an interesting resource that might be of interest to you. Other ideas? So uh, this would be a very common thing, I guess, for parents. Well, if I want my son to well, uh, do things, well, I, I'm thinking that I'm his mentor, but he is not responsive to that. Well, how would you deal with that? Could you say that one more time? So let's say, well, um, I'm, I try to act as a mentor to my son. Mm -hmm. and, uh, well, so I'm in academia and I think that he's going to go to academia and I'm telling him that I'll oh, do this, do that, but he doesn't listen because I'm his dad. So how do you deal with that kind of situation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's something that, I mean, cause I have, I have two teenagers, so I am fully in the, we know more than you phase of parenting. Um, <laughs> One of the things that I find helpful is is uh, finding ways for information to not come from me. And so like leaving books out that have to do with something that I want my kids to know or like sharing a YouTube video with them or having some of my friends talk to them or my sister, because they'll listen to my sister way more than they'll talk to me. My sister's the cool aunt. And so... Be like, hey, like if you're talking to my kids, could you maybe just like drop in X? Um, I feel like that can work. I feel like there's a lot of parallels between being a professor and being a parent. And so I feel like that's something that, you know, kind of like coming in around the back and saying like, hey, um, like here's some interesting information. It's not necessarily from me and I'm not telling you what to do, but um. Someone privately in the chat also is talking about anonymity in academia and uh, the challenges that you have with closed door meetings that people can say things about you and you don't really know who's saying it or why. Um, that can be something really frustrating in academia as well. I don't know if anybody has, I'm not sure that I have solutions to that. There are some things about academic structures that are just frustrating. Although you can always talk to the OMSBUDS office, um, any issues that you have uh, with anything on campus with your work environment, that's a, a great resource. Um, if you're not familiar with it, being able to talk to an OMSBUDS person is a useful way to get advice from someone who's not connected to the situation and they can give you guidance on how to address concerning situations. Well, with that, we are just arrive arriving at 1 p.m. And so uh, I will let you all move on with your day. Thank you so much for joining me and for having this productive discussion. I love these teaching chats because I always learn a lot from other people about how they approach different things. And so I'm walking away from this with some great ideas um, and pieces of advice that I can use giving to other people in, in uh, my role mentoring others. So thank you very much for joining me. For those who are joining us asynchronous, asynchronously after the fact, thank you for joining us and we will see you next week. <laughs>